I'm going to kind of approach, uh, approach this a little bit differently today, the gospel and, and also the sermon. I wanted to uh, kind of set, talk a little bit about a couple of uh, photographs we have here and help you think about some things as we move forward. Um, as you know, back in January, Beth and I went to the Holy Land and uh, spent about a week there. And uh, this particular passage or this path here is a path uh, from the Mount of Olives moving into Jerusalem, okay? And it would have been a path that Jesus would have walked several times in that last week of his life because at night he would go, uh, he would spend the evenings in Bethany, which was at the foot of the Mount of Olives, and then he would walk up the mountain and come back down and spend the next day in Jerusalem. And then he would walk back up and do that sort of thing, back and forth. Now, and the Mount of Olives really is more like a really, really big hill. So it's not, it was, it was a good exercise, but it wasn't outrageous. But this would have been the path. Um, and on top of that, this path also, if, if you can imagine to the right of this path a little bit, would have been the house of Caiaphas. And Caiaphas, so uh, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane outside of Jerusalem. He was handed over, and then he walks back up this path, and then he would be turning uh, uh, this way into uh, see Caiaphas. And then if we go to the next slide, you, he would have been put in this dungeon. And this is, he would have been... Uh, lifted down or, or, or brought down into this dungeon and he would have been uh, in this dungeon for the last night of his life. And that would have been just a little bit off of the path uh, and uh, Beth and I had the opportunity to be in that dungeon and it was, uh, it really was a rather extraordinary thing, in fact. Uh, so we can go to the next slide and we'll leave it there, but that's the path. And so Jesus walks up, he is now put in the dungeon, and then the last time he enters Jerusalem, which would be uh, Holy Thursday, uh, he walks down that path, or no, I mean Good Friday would be the last time, and, and then the rest of the day unfolds. And so let me read just a few passages uh, of Scripture from Luke uh, 19. Right at the crest where the Mount of Olives begins its descent, the whole crowd of his disciples burst into enthusiastic praise over the mighty works that they had witnessed over the last three years. And then some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, you really should get your disciples under control. But Jesus said if they kept quiet, even the stones would do it for them, shouting their praise. And when the city came into view, he wept over it. He said if you had only recognized this day and everything that was good for you, but it's too late. In the days ahead, your enemies are going to bring up their heavy artillery and surround you and press you from every side. They'll smash you, and not one stone will be left intact. All of this because you simply refused to accept the true peace. Going into the temple after he entered Jerusalem, he uh, began to throw everyone out, who had set up shop saying, uh, selling everything and anything. And he said, it is written in the scripture, my house is a house of prayer. You have turned it into a religious bazaar. From then he taught each day at the temple. The high priests, the religious scholars, and the leaders of the people were trying their best to find a way to get rid of him. But the people were hanging on to every word he spoke. The Gospel of the Lord. 
Grace and peace to you from Creator God the Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, brought to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so today, we, we get an opportunity to, to reflect on the mission of Jesus, kind of the summary statement that he is making after three years of ministry. He is, he is traveling all throughout Palestine, all the reaches of Palestine, and he's preaching this message of peace, of justice, mercy, forgiveness, compassion. He's preaching this message to the rich and the poor alike over a three-year period. And as he is doing this, he is really, in a sense, channeling the same message that the prophets delivered before him, recognizing the inequities that took place historically throughout this region over hundreds and hundreds of years. Jesus takes the mantle and he moves this message forward, this rabbi from Nazareth, trying to encourage people to recognize that God's greatest hope for them is to become a community giving and receiving the gifts that they have been freely given by their Creator God. The message was a powerful one, and it was received by many, but the great challenge that Jesus faced in the midst of that is that 10% of the population in Palestine was profoundly wealthy, 90% was overwhelmingly poor, and worked exceedingly hard to just simply survive. All of the excess that they had uh, uh, achieved went to the rich, and the rich uh, benefited from all that hard labor. Jesus saw the pain in those who were oppressed. He recognized that they were li their lives were not long lives. They were painful lives. There were lives that did not have much hope. It's tough when you work all day, all night, and you just barely have enough to eat. And Jesus saw the pain and the suffering in their eyes. He recognized the challenge, and just like all of the prophets before him, he challenged the community to loosen itself up and to share its abundance with each other, recognizing that in truth there were remarkable talents within the poor that never could be fully realized because they lived a life of subsistence. The kingdom of God, rightly understood, is a kingdom that reflects the life of all people and it holds every single life as overwhelmingly sacred, created by God. Jesus recognized over that three-year period that there was a crescendo of descent that was building up for his ministry, largely coming from the powerful. Because for the kingdom of God to actually be at realized, the powerful would have to release that power. They would have to be able to share and open themselves up in a whole new way. They'd have to reconfigure that community and that world in which they lived, and there was much resistance to do so. Jesus knew all along that the message that he needed to deliver would be delivered in such a way that it would meet his death. And so he comes in this day, this Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Good Friday, with all of his disciples gathering outside of Jerusalem, waving these amazing palms and, and encouraging his involvement, and he comes into Jerusalem, and immediately he goes to the temple. And he holds court, really, for four days. He goes back to Bethany at night. But over that period of time, Jesus is offering his summary statements about what it means to be a people of God. He is delivering his summary statements that suggest mightily that God wants us to be one, that the shalom, the peace that surpasses all understanding, is within our midst if only we would be willing to take hold of it. Finally, 
the powers that be finish their conspiring against Jesus and make preparations to arrest him. But before they do, Jesus uh, enters an upper room on Holy Thursday with his disciples. He preaches and teaches one more time. He washes their feet, remembering how Mar Mary washed his feet a week before, or not a week, yeah, a day before. And, uh, or, well, about a week, I guess. And then, uh, and he washes their feet. He, uh, he preaches to them. He tries to prepare them for a life that they would have to move forward, recognizing his life was about to end. But he recognized that these disciples were going to be the next wave, the next wave of shalom. Those men and women who would take that message back out into the world and continue to proclaim God's holy world, word to a people who were struggling to make ends meet. And finally, after the supper, he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is outside of the walls of Jerusalem, and he prays. He is filled with anxiety and anguish. He would prefer that there would be another way, but he recognizes that there is none. And finally, he is turned over to the authorities, taken up to Caiaphas' house, up this path, and he is put into a dungeon for the night. He gets up, he's whipped 39 times. If he had been whipped 40 times, he would have been freed. 40 was forgiveness back in the day. But he was whipped 39. And then continued on to Jerusalem to be tried before the temple elite, before Rome, before Herod. And finally, he is condemned to death nailed to a cross, and dies between two common criminals. He, uh, the man Jesus, the rabbi, toward the last few breaths, recognized that um, there were only three people, friends, that he could see. Everyone else had scattered. In his humanness, he might have thought that his uh, mission was a failure. Nobody was left. But then he died. And he became seed, if you will. His life was a type of a seed that began to grow in a whole new way through each of us. He delivered the message that the Alpha and the Omega of reality is peace. There's only one message. There's only one hope. And so, over the years, over the generations, this message of hope, this message of peace has been delivered throughout the ages. In truth, it's always been a minority message. Culture may have captured it in some way, but in the end, the prophetic voice that invites people to become one and encourages people to become one has always been a bit of a voice crying out in the wilderness. There have been remnants, there have been disciples, there have been people that struggle to do these things, and we have been given that opportunity to do it as well. As we reflect on this life, and as we reflect on the faith that we have been given, Jesus offers us a model, a model that demonstrates the possibilities that exist. It's not easy doing this Christianity thing. It's hard. There are edges to it. And Jesus always said, fear not, before he sent his disciples out. 
because it is a little bit scary at times. But the good news is that we do have Christ, Jesus who has become Christ. We have the Holy Spirit in our very midst. We have the still, small voice gently speaking to us. And we have the opportunity in every aspect of our life to experience that peace and to gently move it forward. To offer a new hope, a new opportunity. To see each person that we work with, that we play with, that we live with as sacred. And to open our hearts and our minds, recognizing that God is with us. Amen.